Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Disco Elysium with me, Bring It On. So I changed my mind, I want to go talk to the union workers first, just in case it does take a long time to do. Can I interact with this window? Behind the dock workers, a ceiling height window. The hawthorn branches scrape the glass like bony fingers. It's not time yet. Uh, squint. There's a little slide panel up there to let some air in. No need to open it in spring. It's still too cold outside. Okay, well, hold off on this for right now. Revert your gaze. Over here. She snaps her fingers. Let me handle this. The woman says to the crowd in the mess hall before turning to you. Detective disorientated. Are you still wondering where you are? This is Martinez, in case you've forgotten. I advise you not to overstay your welcome. She smiles coldly. Her entire character has shifted. This young woman is cold as ice. Hmm. You're the gardener. No, I am not a gardener. I'm a legal counselor for the Dock Workers Union. She crosses her arms. So let's get to it. You're looking for Titus Hardy? You think he has information that will help you? Maybe he does. She points to the man to her right, or on her right. That's Titus. Talk to him, but know this. I'll be keeping an eye on you. No strong arming, nothing official. The district of Martinez does not recognize your authority to make arrests. It doesn't matter if you recognize our authority. We will make an arrest if we have to. She says nothing. Her glare speaks for her. Oh, what's your role in all this? Like I already told you, I'm a legal counselor. Do you have hearing problems? She crosses her arms. What if I want to talk to you, not Titus? What you want is of no significance, officer. Don't test your authority. In Martinez, you are no one. What are you going to do to me? Hmm. Lieutenant is not satisfied with the approach. What are we going to do to you? <laughs> she starts laughing. It's a cold laughter, devoid of joy. The union isn't going to do anything to you. It is not a crime syndicate. It is a labor organization. Mm -hmm. Oh. Goddamn right it is. A gruff hump from the table. If anything, it is the RCM who do things to people. But we digress. She shakes her head. Now, why are you so aggressive? Aggressive? You make your living enforcing violence. These people are just dock workers. Hmm. So you were spying on us. And now you represent murder suspects. Just dock workers. Listen. You moral intern lackeys. You're a mob. Enforcing the unlawful privatization of Revishal. Twenty fat men in the Occident are stealing it all. And you're their bodyguards. Fuck yeah. The tall, broad-shouldered man takes a sip of his beer. So ask what you came to ask. Or get back to your commanders. Um, I don't really like any of these comments. Yeah, let's do that. Let's ask those questions. Let's. Her expression stiffens. I should talk to Titus then. Alright, Titus, let's chat. This is where you say you're a bit. A broad-shouldered man points at you with a beer can. Detective. The lieutenant acknowledges you with a sharp no note. Uh, he's leaving it to you. Yeah, we need to talk about the hanged man out back. Oh, this is about him. A real looker, that one. He looks around. You're sure taking your time. Waiting for him to get ripe and pretty for you, huh? Shanky. Oh, he was a real pretty boy by now. Real hot stuff. Letting out that pretty boy smell. Glenn nods along. Time to go to work in the shit factory! 
Hey. My uh, my subconscious said the same thing. Easy, boys. These janitors have a hell of a job cut out for them. I mean, I wouldn't go in there for a million. He slaps his forehead. You might want to start asking your questions now. It's not going to get better than this. Do a head count first. Connect these men to the tracks you saw in the yard. Chances are they're going to match. Scan the room. Starting from the right. Boot size, 44. Blonde man, in his 30s. Overbearingly masculine. Sitting on his right. Standard working boots. Size, 45 or 46. Eldest in the room. Probably mid-50s. Smoker. Quiet. Across at the other table. Hobnailed working boots. Size, 43. Gang tattoos. Mesk or Sarah Maritzian in his late 30s, early 40s. He spent his youth in Villa Lobos, a housing project in the Jamrock Quarter. There were incarcerations. Hard to say what else. The ink is fading. And then, standard working boot. Steel reinforced toes. Size 46. The big dick. Wide at the shoulders and lean at the hips. Rugby cap. Fingerless gloves. And numerous scars. A little under 40. The emblem on his vest says Rowan Club. A little patch below it reads, T. Hardy, Captain. In the far corner, standard working boot, steel reinforced toes, size 44, 40 something, non alcoholic beverage in hand. You squint. Is that a plectrum? Uh, where? On his neck. Forget it. It's not important. Let's call this one the musician. And the little guy. Size 41, with the light step. Not a child, after all. An older man with a rat face, mean, watery eyes, and two front teeth missing. In the middle, heaving and wheezing. Big guy, boot size 46, deep marks. Probably carried the victim over. He alone is 130 kilos. Add the man in armor, and you could easily exceed 220. In conclusion, these seven are the actors on the crime scene. The footprints were theirs, but there's a discrepancy. One of them is missing. The odd soul. Exactly. You've stood there for about four seconds, not saying anything. Hit them with questions. Where's the eighth Hardy? The fuck is with you, fella? The man in the uh, the man hanged in the backyard. Did you do it? The pretty boy. You guys really love talking about that pretty boy. He takes a sip from his can. Funny. But my partner and I have a serious matter to discuss with you. The lieutenant says without a smile. Why is there a container belt around the dead man's neck? Container belt? Like we use in the harbor? Yes. Why? Because we took it from the harbor where we were. Then we went out back and used it to hang him. He says. We did this. Together. All of us. Until he was dead. That's why there's a container belt around his neck. He looks you dead in the eye. Aha. Uh -huh. So you just confessed to murder. God damn right. I. No. These seven... Honest men have equally come forth. They told you what happened so that you don't waste any more of your time. The woman interjects. Uh, let's do another thought real fast. So we just leveled up. Kingdom of Conscience. I think that's, yeah, that's all my thoughts. Cool. You murder him just like that. No remorse. How many people have you sent to the Shays? Ever felt remorse for them? Shays Electrique is the method of capital punishment in Revachon under the coalition. During the suzerain's reign, 
It used to be the firing squad. For send them to reunion to rot. For 20 years. For life. He says it as if it were worse than dying. Yeah, what we do is different. We enforce the law. You just kill people like it's nothing. But you see, a law, lawman, is something people agree upon. And here in Martinez, we agreed that this man had to die. No, that's that's mob justice. Mob justice is dangerous and it's bad. No. Uh, he says, squeezing his beer can. Who called the shots that night? Are you deaf? There will be no singling anyone out. You can't arrest a Hardy Boy without arresting all Hardy Boys. I used to read the Hardy Boys, okay? They were, they were good, good kids. Do you think you could do that? Do you think you could arrest them all? A shadow of a smirk passes her lips as she tilts her head. No, but seriously, who calls the shots around here? <laughs> who do you fucking think does? He sounds more amused than angry. Fat Angus. Um, hmm. I don't know if I should antagonize them. Let's bow to the bearded man. Gangs are usually run by the oldest, most venerable member. <coughs> the old man lets out an annoyed cough that reaches into his pocket for another cigarette. Theo's a great guy. A, a great guy. But come on. Titus Hardy runs the Hardy Boys. That's why we're called the Hardy Boys, genius. He spreads his arms. I think you got your answer, Mr. Law. Titus grins. Yes, there are some administrative differences. But on that night, they all acted as one man. She gives Titus a stern look. Uh, why did this hanging incident occur? You don't have to keep answering his questions. The fixer turns to remind Titus. I know, Lizzie. Relax. We killed him last Sunday night. Seemed like a good way to end the week. He takes a sip. How long have you known the victim? Known him? We don't associate with scum like that, asshole. Yeah! Who do you think we are? Quiet. He came around about three weeks ago when that Pines cow first sailed into town. Happy? Titus gives Glenn a stern look. By the Pines cow, you mean Joyce Messier? The representative for White Pines? The same company you are striking against? Lieutenant pretends to check his notes. No. I mean the Pines cow. The stupid ass cow they sent in to fuck us over. But you know what? He rubs his chin, pretending to mull it over. Why don't you ask her about the pretty boy? I'm sure she has interesting things to say when you ask her hard enough. That's enough insinuation for today, Titus. Officer. Your interview is drawing to an end. Don't waste your last questions. She turns to you. Why did you kill him? Why? Because he was worthless mercenary scum. And he stepped out of line in my town. He hisses through his teeth. So he was a mercenary. That's it. And he stepped out of line. He repeats. Jaw clamps shut like a vice. What kind of mercenary? The kind that shows up when you start a strike. The experienced kind, too. Had Kohoi and Semenin written all over him. ex oranese special forces. A live grenade. Right here in our bar. The man spreads his arms. I can't prove it. But I know he was sent by the Wild Pines. They hire merc shit like that. Story of every strike from here to Samara. Hold on. How do you even know he was in special forces? Cause one night he walked straight up to the mic and said, I'm on these goddamn special forces and I'm gonna fuck you all. Really? Yeah, really. Had a gin and tonic up there, sang some Aranese paratrooper song and said he's gonna fuck everyone. We couldn't believe it either. But he fucking did. 
right there. Like some kind of animal. He points at the stage. Sire, the tale is true. This is a serious violation of the karaoke code. Okay, besides crimes against karaoke, what did he actually do wrong? Wrong? He harassed women, raped one, harassed workers, threatened to kill some as a warning. Uh, he roars, and then he wipes spittle from his mouth. There's a slight unease in him, suddenly. He regrets mentioning the rape. To kill us all, if we don't open the gates, if we don't let the scabs in, if we don't bend over. And that was before he started coming here. He cracks his knuckles. Yeah, he said it was his favorite joint now. Started coming here every night. Drinking, grabbing girls, grab one of ours mid karaoke right there on the stage. He grabbed someone? Lieutenant is trying to make sense of this flood of information. Yeah, this girl's on the mic. A beautiful girl, young. Gets into the second verse of Lover Lake. The fucker grabs her legs, starts screaming. Show me your cunt. Why don't you show me your cunt? Then, he gets knocked on the head with a wine bottle. Doesn't even fall down. He shakes his head in disbelief. Was this the same girl who was sexually assaulted? A uh, raped, you said. Aren't you fucking listening? My man is talking to you. He took care of it. They got the girl out before anything else could happen. Yeah, me and Eugene got her out. Aren't you fucking listening? He repeats like a parrot. There's something odd here. Yeah, right. But who did he rape then? This is a very serious allegation. No. You're not getting a name. That's a Martinez matter. And I'm not discussing it with you clowns. There's a moment of silence. There's nothing you can do for now. He's stonewalling you. So how did you kill him? We hanged him up by his neck. Until he got real still. Wasn't that obvious, copper? Didn't they teach you anything at the cop school, idiot? This is where an autopsy would come in handy. You have to work with what you know. We need more. Did you muffle him? We haven't heard any reports of screams. Titus, you don't have to clarify anything. We overpowered him. Dragged his unconscious body to the tree. Put a noose around his neck. And hanged him till he was dead and steady. Then we left him for seagulls, maggots, and you fucks. The small man points at you. Make them a bit more uncomfortable first. Then see if it all adds up. Wasn't he a trained killer from Oranier's Oren special forces? If yes, then how did you manage to overpower him? With numbers, asshole. How do you think? You're right, Lizzie. I've done enough explaining here. He looks at the woman. No, he hasn't. Not yet. Where does overpowering happen? Weren't you fucking listening? The fucker came to our bar. It happened right here. He looks around. Man, a 28% chance is not great. Uh, things aren't quite right here, are they? Actually, they're admirably, surprisingly composed. The entire room. Given how many questions you've lobbed their way. All of them? Maybe one of them is fidgeting, cracking under the pressure. Well, this one. But he's always fidgeting, so don't get your hopes up. Right. Have other questions about the lynching. Like what, copper? Why don't I just arrest you? Step closer to Titus. Yeah, lawman. Why don't you? He takes a step closer as well, fixing his ball cap. It's almost an anthropological sight, watching him try to assert dominance over you. Not in the arresting mood? His mean little eyes come alive with hatred. By your side, the lieutenant keeps his hand away from his holster. You hear the nylon of his coat hiss as he steps closer. Easy. Walk back from the provocation. They're armed, and they outnumber us. The lieutenant tries to establish eye contact with you. All right, easy now. Let's just talk. Back off. Wise move. You made the right choice there. Now 
I'll make another one and get the fuck out of our booth. We're not gonna do this again. He leans back against the table. So, what are we going to do now? Conclude the questioning. Nothing. Your investigation here is done. Leave Martinez, go back to your stations where you belong. Her reply comes sharp. I think we're going to stick around, thanks. Some things don't add up here, Titus. Lieutenant closes his notebook. I've done this job for long enough to know that people don't just confess to first-degree murder. Even if it is a group responsibility, we're going to look into this. Good luck with that. You've heard everything a rent-a-cop is gonna hear from us. Real law officials. You're lucky you didn't get a beaten. He grabs another beer. I want to talk about the hanging again. Again. Just get the dead guy's autograph, since you're his biggest fan. <laughs> Good one, Titus. A burst of laughter in the room. The little guy's the loudest. Uh, he fawns. About fucking time. I found eight sets of footprints, but there's only seven of you. Where's the eighth hardy boy? What are you talking about, madman? There's no eighth hardy boy. There's seven of us, and we're all here. He sizes you up. Or what? You want to be the eighth hardy boy? We ain't hiring. He shakes his head. Actually, boss, we've been talking and we think she could maybe... Shut the fuck up, Glenn! I do the talking here. Now what the fuck do you want, cop? He roars. It has to be good if he won't let you pursue it. Looks like the lieutenant thinks so, too. So let me get this straight. There is an ace hardy boy. It's a she, and you don't like us talking about her? That's right. We're not talking about this. This is a private hardy boy's matter. Nothing to do with your shit. End. He points at the lieutenant. You're not cops here. Don't go digging around if you don't want a bullet in the back of your head. I'm watching you. Good. We are all watching each other. Officer, your question. Lieutenant adjusts his spectacles. I love Kim. <laughs> Just taking it all in stride. There's no point in pushing it further, he thinks. This is already a victory. We'll learn more about this eighth hardy sooner or later. All right, I'm going to take off now. Well, that's really interesting. So they just straight up admitted to the murder. But now I have a different task ahead of me. That, that's not what I was expecting in this investigation. Indirect modes of taxation. Turns out those financial oversight committee gangsters stuffed millions of hard-earned dividends away in the last place anyone thought to look. The hearts and minds of everyday River Sholians. You need to spread that deregulation gospel to the people. Tell them about that foreign fear tax. Preach that 98% gross burden. Preach it, preacher man. Set the brothers free. Taxes are racist. Ultra liberal dialogue options give plus one real, minus one empathy, thinks he's a hustler or something. Okay. I think that was the one that was minus two to empathy while I was researching it, right? Yes, and that's only minus one. I've got nothing to say to you. Why are you wasting your time? She crosses her arms. Are you the hardy girl? I am not. She says dryly. You could be Liz. You could be anything. You could even be a model. Even a model? Glenn, I went to law school. I am an attorney. Her face stiffens. He's right. With a face like that, she could be on the cover of Le Debutante International. Uh, he's right, you know. You're very pretty. The cold look in her eyes speaks louder than words. She is not amused. It's not her. She's not a hardy girl. Definitely. All right, maybe we'll talk later. All right. Uh, let's talk with the cook first, and we'll work our way back through all the uh, denizens of the Whirling and Rags. The man ponders his cooking utensils and gives you a little nod, acknowledging your presence. Is that the new to say? 
True Authority, buy Fallen Pants from Kuno, Smoker in the Balcony, looking for armor, and closing the trash. Let's see if Gart has anything to say. Can I help you? Another thing, yes. Alright, the cryptozoologist's wife. Just a moment. The old woman turns back to the cafeteria manager. And there's no public phones nearby? The closest phone booth is down the coast. Sorry for the inconvenience, ma'am. The cafeteria manager appears genuinely ap apologetic. It's fine, I understand. Thank you anyway. I'm glad to see you again, dear. She turns back to you with a weary smile. A good day, ma'am. Everything all right? Oh, please don't trouble yourself about me, sweetie. I was just hoping to make a call, but the Whirling's phone line isn't working. The union office probably has a phone, but I can't really get there. Or to the phone booth down the coast. And Gary's phone is dead, too. She sighs. Wait, what's wrong with the phone lines? The manager was vague about it. She frowns. Why would he be vague about phone problems? This is something to look into later. Ask God, maybe. Why did you need to use the phone anyway? To let the young woman who's house-sitting for us know that we may be delayed. Morel, my husband, and Gary were supposed to get back by Monday night, but they're still missing, and I haven't heard from them. I was also hoping she'd heard from Morel. She looks down. A little missing persons puzzle might just be the thing to take your mind off the hangover. Okay, I'll bite. Has your husband gone missing before? That's just it. This isn't like him at all. He always plans his expeditions so carefully. But you have more important things to worry about. She glances out the window toward the bay. Uh, what is this expedition your husband was on? Just some field work, sweetie. Morel is a highly trained scientist. He and his assistant Gary are studying an extremely rare species of insect. But they should have returned by now. They were just going down the coast across the water lock to set a few traps... He said they'd be back on Monday. What could be keeping them? She sighs. The water lock. That was broken. Could this be it? Wait, who is this Gary person? Do you trust him? Oh, sweetie. It's nothing like that. She smiles. Gary's as loyal as they come. I trust him with my husband's life any day. The water lock on the other side of the coast is broken. They're probably just stuck over there. Oh my. What happened to the water lock? Uh, probably just some technical problem. Well, whatever the cause, I'm thankful. To both of you. You've spared me another sleepless night. She turns to the lieutenant. You're welcome, ma'am. I hate to ask, but if your investigation takes you to the other side of the coast, please do keep an eye out for my husband. This will surely lead to a cryptozoological mystery with that extremely rare insect. Yes, some left field scientific research is exactly what you need right now. Funk up that vanilla murder investigation. And if you see him, let him know Lena is waiting for him here at the Whirling. He gets so tangled up in his work that he may not know the water lock's been repaired. And it's cold out there. If I see him. I'll let him know you're here, when or if I get there. Oh, you're such a dear. Thank you, sweetie. So your husband is some kind of scientist? Oh, yes. A zoologist. A cryptozoologist, to be more precise. She says with a pinch of pride. <laughs> what is cryptozoology? It's a pseudoscience that attempts to legitimize research into mythological beasts and urban legends. Lieutenant sounds unimpressed. That's uh, one opinion, yes. And people are entitled to their opinions. My apologies, ma'am. I did not mean to undermine your hobby. It's not a hobby, dear. It's a subfield of zoology. One specializing in animal species that are so exceedingly rare that many assume them to be extinct or even fictitious. Searching for such species called cryptids is difficult and often thankless. 
and frankly, many scientists are too lazy to do it. Universities these days are rarely interested in supporting real research. The quality of research at Revacholian universities has been on the decline, but you doubt there was ever a time when cryptozoology was embraced by the academic elite. Tell me more about Morel. Looks, character, your relationship. Oh dear. I'm not sure where to begin. What does your husband look like? Hmm. Well, his expression is slightly grumpy, but his eyes are always bright and curious, like a small boy's. And his palms are quite coarse from all the field work, but he's quite gentle. You can't go around forever sure feeling grown men's hands. If you want to find her husband, you'll need more concrete information. Let's try again. Why don't you try describing him as you would one of your cryptids? Oh, well, he's a bit shorter than you, but with a larger frame, and he has longish white hair, usually a bit uncombed. You might say wild, even. The lieutenant pulls out his notebook and begins jotting down the woman's description. One other thing, he'll likely have all kinds of field gear on him, even if he's not out in the reeds, you know, just in case. How long have you been married? We'll be celebrating our 16th anniversary this autumn. Not the most numerically satisfying anniversary, but I like the less obvious milestones even more somehow. Her smile is soft. How did the two of you meet? By a dating agency, I'm ashamed to say. I was looking to get back into the scene after recovering from my accident, and he'd just divorced. We hit it off, and... Well, here we are. She smiles wistfully. She's skipping over some important parts. Perhaps you'll find out more later. I think I have all the information I need. Uh, let's move on. I hope I've been useful. Tell me more about this rare insect your husband is looking for. Oh, sweetie, it's fascinating. But I shouldn't bore you with entomological minutiae. Uh, she catches herself. The lieutenant gives you a sideways glance. No. I want to hear about the insect. Well, it's a phasmid, technically, but... She hesitates. Ah, yes. Phasmatodia. A diverse group of insects whose bodies resemble twigs, leaves, that sort of thing. Ghost insects. Colloquially. Oh, yeah. Here comes the interesting... Where other phasmids imitate sticks or leaves, this one's a living reed. It disguises itself among the reeds here on the Insul Indian coast. Hence it's named the Insul Indian Phasmid. Perhaps you'll end up co-discovering the Phasmid with us, officers. She looks you in the eye and nods thoughtfully. I knew it. We're going to be chasing made-up insects with cryptozoologists. Lieutenant size. It's not made up, officer. I can assure you. It's simply elusive, so much so that most establishment zoologists doubt it exists at all. What makes you think the phasmid is around here? Well, some teenagers making out in the reeds saw one. They, they didn't know what it was, of course, but there was a brief article in a local newspaper about their encounter with a ghost insect that looks like the reeds. Gary sent us the clipping. So newspaper clipping is all the evidence you have. Of course, most phasmid sightings turn out to be false alarms, but their description matched the Insul Indian phasmid perfectly, and they didn't even know what they were looking at. So, is it dangerous? <laughs> Not at all. Why else would it hide itself so carefully? She chuckles to herself. Is it valuable? Oh, I doubt it. No one gets into cryptozoology for the money, sweetie. Does it have cool powers? Yes. It can blend in almost perfectly among the reeds. It's how it stayed hidden all these years. Centuries, even. Her face lights up at the thought of it. Okay. Uh, what's so special about this stick bug, then? Oh, dear. I'm afraid I'm not explaining this very well. It is very special. The woman's face flushes with embarrassment. Morel can explain it all much better. I wish you could hear him describe it. Then you'd understand, I'm sure. Maybe you could convince her to tell you about some cool cryptids. You're an enthusiastic idiot, but you're still an idiot. <laughs> I want to know everything about cryptids. 
Living cryptids, extinct cryptids, marine cryptids, land cryptids, bring it on. We don't have time for Cryptozoology 101. Let's get back to work, shall we? Well, that's all for now, ma'am. Ma'am. Wow. So someone's been a little boring. What? Yes, my standard liege. Someone's seen all sorts of wild ideas pop off and thought, I'll take the boring one. The regular, please. The brown. Sorry, I just hit my microphone. Uh, Kim, am I boring? You? I wouldn't worry about that. He looks at you. See? You're so regular and vinyl brown, he doesn't even want to talk to you about it. Look, I'm just trying to do my job. No need for extravagance. Of course you do. Let's get right to it. My lord's copotype is regular cop. I'll let everyone know. I'll send out a telefax. <laughs> wait, wait. Will this be my copotype now? Yes, the type of cop you are, sire. Think of it as a caste, a class even, a nation of regular law officials that you belong to. It comes, of course, with the usual benefits. <laughs> Oh, uh, why not? Send out the Telefax, then. I'm not ashamed. Done and done. No actual communiques will be sent, of course. That would be too dramatic. Alright, so we got a new copper type. Regular law official. My student Inland Empire. Not a big fan of that. I really like the Inland Empire checks. Okay, so looks like you've got a bit of the normal in you. A touch of the regular. Four grams of Johnny Normal Cop. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? You, the extremist of all the cops. You said some pretty boring things back there, and now you have two choices. You can either leave it behind and forget about it, or you can try to utilize your normalcy. Internalize it. Get a touch of vanilla back into the herring-flavored egg and licorice, a licorice ice cream of your mind. <laughs> okay. Well, I think what I want to do next is try to find a way up to the top of the Whirling and Rags to talk to that uh, woman that's up there. But we'll probably have to take care of that next time. I'm going to call it here. Uh, next time I'll look for a way to get to the roof of the Whirling and Rags. And then uh, I guess we'll head towards the actual Union, uh, to where the strike is, because we still need to talk to Everard Claire and see if we can get some help taking that body down. Either way, thanks for watching. I hope to see you guys in the next one.